The 737 MAX has gained a lot of media attention over the last year. Today we are going to take a look on not one, but two crashes, as we discover how one of the world's leading aircraft manufacturers fails to design a safe plane. Welcome to Airspace. On the 28th of October 2009, the pilots of a Lion Air 737 MAX from Bali to Jakarta experienced a strange behavior of their plane. As it flew, it displayed several confusing messages to the pilot and tried to lower its nose repeatedly. Luckily, the three pilots present on the flight deck found a way around and disconnected the electric trim system. This system allows the plane's horizontal tailplane to be moved up and down, which is called trimming the aircraft. This allows the plane to be flown more aerodynamically and with less force on the controls. The following day, Lion Air Flight 610 departed Jakarta, only to experience the same problem as the crew before them. The crew of this flight unfortunately struggled a lot more to keep their plane in the air. While they were trying to find and resolve their technical problem, the aircraft tried to lower its nose more and more, ever increasing the force on the control wheel needed to keep the plane flying straight. Ten minutes after takeoff, the required force increased to above 90 pounds, which is about 40 kilograms, in pulling force. When the captain was getting too tired, he handed control to his first officer. The latter could not hold on for long, as the forces now increased even further. As his grip faded, the plane quickly snapped into a sharp descent and impacted the ocean shortly after. Rumors about the accident spread quickly, especially since Lion Air does not have the best safety record, with at least 10 accidents since 1999. Soon, the investigation into the matter started. Five months later, while the investigation was still ongoing, Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302 crashed shortly after takeoff in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia's capital, in a very similar manner. They too reported flight control problems after takeoff and difficulties in maintaining altitude. The flight crashed into a field almost vertically minutes after departure. What happened to those planes? And how could one of the world's newest plane types crash twice in a row in a very similar fashion? What the investigation in the matter brought to light was astonishing and rather shocking to the aviation community. To understand the findings, we must first look at the history of the 737's development. The first 737, the 737-100, was built in 1967. Yes, that was quite a while ago, even before the moon landing. It has since been modified several times, with the 737 MAX being the 12th derivative model of the original certification. Over the years, several improvements have been made to the plane, the newest one in the MAX version being the larger and more fuel-efficient LEAP engines. Since the original 737-100 was designed to be easy to load and board from the ground, without using loading vehicles, it sits rather low to the ground. When the newer and larger engines were supposed to be installed, they did not fit under the wing and had to be mounted further forward and a little higher up to maintain proper ground clearance. The landing gear was also extended by about 20 cm. However, the fact that the engines were mounted further away from the plane's center of gravity meant that they could prove problematic in certain situations. For example, if the plane should enter a situation where it would encounter a very high angle of attack close to a stall, the thrust from the engines could lift the airplane's nose even further. To counteract this, Boeing installed a system called MCAS, the Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System. It was supposed to move the horizontal stabilizer of the plane, should it ever enter a situation where the angle of attack would increase beyond normal values, therefore making a recovery easier for the pilots. So far so good, one would think. But here, in the design of MCAS, Boeing made several very questionable design choices and assumptions. First, it decided that only one of the 737's two angle of attack sensors would be sufficient to trigger the system's response, which means that if one sensor would deliver wrong data, it could make the plane's computer falsely assume that the plane was close to coming to a stall, where it would no longer produce lift and make them move the horizontal stabilizer, so it pushes down the plane's nose. This is rather unheard of. Almost all systems in airliners are built in a redundant way so that a failure of one single component should have no effect. The A320, the 737's competitor for example, has three angle of attack sensors, so that if one fails, it can be excluded easily. Second, Boeing decided that it would be easiest and most cost efficient if pilots needed as little training on the 737 MAX coming from the prior version, the 737NG. To achieve this, they decided to remove any reference to MCAS from the pilot's manuals 
and let the feature be certified as a new addition to the electric system. The FAA, which is the United States Federal Aviation Authority, granted this request. No 737 MAX pilot therefore knew MCAS existed in their planes. Furthermore, Boeing delivered their 737 MAX planes with a feature that could show the pilots when the two angle of attack sensor disagreed, making troubleshooting easier. Also, it was possible to order the 737 MAX with a paid extra feature that displayed the actual angle of attack on a small dial on the flight displays of the pilot. Since most airlines decided this was not worth their money, they decided to forego this option. However, the investigation found out that the alert that should display the disagreeing angle of attack values, which should have been working in all 737 MAXs, would not display in those that did not buy the paid extra feature, rendering the alert inoperative in about 80% of all 737 MAX planes. Had this alert worked, it would have made troubleshooting a lot easier. Boeing knew about this deficiency. In both Lion Air 610 and Ethiopian Airlines 302, one of the angle of attack sensors failed, leading to the activation of MCAS. The system then started to trim the horizontal stabilizer so that the plane would be more nose heavy. According to Boeing, a repeated activation of the system should not have been possible. Nevertheless, it obviously was, since the system activated over 20 nose down trim commands in each accident flight, leading to control forces that were no longer bearable by the pilots. But how could such a system even be certified in an airliner? How could a company with a great reputation such as Boeing create such a flawed system and have it be successfully approved by the Governing Aviation Authority? A very detailed report by the United States House Committee on Transport and Infrastructure looked into this and found several reasons this happened. Boeing was under tremendous financial pressure by Airbus when they announced that they were going to build their A320neo, the newest iteration of the A320, Boeing's main competitor to the 737. Also, Boeing wanted to have the 737 MAX ready at a similar time as the A320neo to be able to compete in the market. They even offered stock options to the project's chief engineer if the deadline was met. Therefore, it was decided to declare MCAS as not safety relevant, make it a part of the existing speed trim system and remove all documentation about it in the pilot's books. This was done to reduce the required amount of training to the new aircraft type. Boeing did not want their customer airlines to be required to do any simulator training on the 737 MAX, but only have the pilots complete several online courses. It even discouraged customers from offering simulator trainings. One email from Boeing's chief technical pilot to a colleague in regard to talk airlines out of the training requirements states, I saved this company a sick amount of dollars. Also, Boeing negotiated deals with airlines such as Southwest, which included a discount of $1 million per plane, should simulator training be required. This would have resulted in a loss for Boeing of $200 to $400 million. All this was done despite Boeing knowing that MCAS was flawed. Already in 2012, early in the development of the 737 MAX, a Boeing test pilot took more than 10 seconds to respond to an uncommanded activation of MCAS. He described the consequences as catastrophic. Boeing never declared this to the FAA. Even after the Lion Air crash, Boeing continued to maintain its stance that MCAS did not interfere with the safe piloting of their aircraft. The company then released a so-called Emergency Airworthiness Directive, which mentioned the possibility of an electric trim runaway should one angle of attack sensor fail, but it never mentioned MCAS by name. But not only Boeing is to blame. The report also states that the FAA, who was formally recognized as being one of the world's leading aviation oversight bodies, failed in its very core task to provide safer aviation. The fact alone that they approve of Boeing's rationale of designing such a flawed system and to exclude any reference to MCAS from the handbooks is striking. Further, it allowed the 737 MAX to continue to operate, even though an internal analysis by the FAA showed that over the lifetime of the 737 MAX model, 15 more similar accidents were to be expected, leading to the potential loss of 2,900 lives. It also approved of Boeing's proposal to not disclose the existence of MCAS after the Lion Air crash, with the rationale that the emergence of a new system would only confuse pilots. The report clearly states, the FAA's aviation oversight system failed in dramatic fashion. The report ends in the following paragraph. Unfortunately, serious questions remain as to whether Boeing and the FAA have fully and correctly learned the lessons from the MAX failures. Several weeks before this report was finalized, 
Multiple news stories suggested that Boeing was endeavoring to change the name of the 737 MAX to the 7378 in an effort to combat the indelible image problems now surrounding the aircraft. If the committee's investigation offers any lessons for Boeing, it is that a name change and public relations effort will not address the cultural issues at Boeing that hampered the safety of the 737 MAX in the first place and ultimately led to two fatal accidents and the death of 346 people. A name change may help confront a public relations problem, but only a genuine, holistic and assertive commitment to changing the cultural issues unearthed in the committee's investigation at both Boeing and the FAA can enhance aviation safety and truly help Boeing and the FAA learn from the dire lessons of the 737 MAX tragedies. Thanks everyone for watching. If you liked the video, please leave a like and subscribe for many more aviation videos to come. See you in the next one.